myself. Yeah, we're on, ready. Great, I'm ready when you are. So welcome to our session from, uh, with Sienna from the Campaign Against the Arms Trade. So I'm going to hand over to Sienna for everybody to hear what she has to say. Thank you very much, Lauren and Woodcroft Folk crew. Um, so yeah, I'm Sienna Bangura and I am the Training and Events Coordinator at Campaign Against Arms Trade. Um, and I am going to basically run through um, a session I like to call Arms Trade 101 and Intersecting Issues. So as a bit of background, um, Campaign Against Arms Trade, um, for the last while now actually, we've been doing a lot of work around emphasising the fact that the global arms trade should not be understood as a silo issue, as something that you know works in isolation from other struggles. We've been doing a lot of work on connecting it to issues such as militarised policing, borders control and migration, climate justice, um, and more kind of um, recently and very topical um, coronavirus and, that, and the pandemic, for example. So we have making it very clear for us to win. We need to understand how the arms trade is deeply connected and intricately um, related to other areas of struggle, um, understanding that its foundations are racism, colonialism, capitalism, and so on and so forth. Um, we've done a six week reading group, um, reading series that we completed in the summer. Um, that was kind of going in depth at all of these issues um, individually and having guest speakers in. Um, and before that, we also had a, a great panel event which kind of set the scene um, for a holistic over, overview and understanding of the issue. And now this particular um, presentation, um, a brief presentation, is just to kind of digest and crunch these um, things and make them accessible, particularly to a younger audience. So hope you enjoy it. First and foremost, um, this image here, I just want to credit the artist, and um, that is Letty Wilson. She is an artist um, and she was commissioned by me to create the front cover of our new magazine called People Not War. Um, this zine is again a really handy resource to explain the arms trade, hopefully in digestible, accessible language for all audiences. And this is our latest version of it. So one thing that is a thread in this presentation is actually the song um, Soundtrack to the Struggle by an artist called Loki. So I really, really love Loki. Um, he's a conscious artist, a conscious rapper, um, and he is a friend of Campaign Against Arms Trade. He is known in the movement space um, as someone who fights for freedom, fights for justice. And this particular song is one of my favorites. It's definitely the kind, it's the tune that you have when you're marching um, on the streets, on the grounds, speaking truth to power um, in normal times um, and other times. Uh, but it's really the soundtrack to the revolution, in my opinion, one of. And I thought I, I would pull out this particular quote, I'm a product of the system I was born to destroy. So at this point, I think it'd be really useful for whoever's watching this and listening to this to have a think about what does this sentence make you think of? What do you think of and how do you feel when, when you see this? What does it mean, basically? And I think for me, my understanding is that it's actually very important to note that you are not exempt from uh, experiencing and um, replicating a lot of the issues that we're trying to um, dismantle, basically, because we are raised in a capitalist system, we're raised in a patriarchal system, we are raised in systems of white supremacy. Um, you know, the best of us even will be affected by that. And so this idea of being a conscious person is something that is work um, and it's work that we have to do continuously and I think it's really important for young people to to know that basically and to know that um, it's it's work that we have to do continuously um, it's work that we need to be really conscious of so I just thought that was like an interesting way to open to think about the fact that we are all actually products of the systems that we were born to destroy so as I've kind of started to talk about um, racism colonialism, policing, borders, COVID-19, climate injustice and climate justice, class, gender, LGBTQ plus issues. What do all these things have to do with the arms trade? Well, everything. Um, I think it's really important that we understand these issues are not tangential, um, but foundational to um, the arms trade, 
um, a very much a system that polices the world, a system that loots the world, a system of control, basically, a way particularly for richer countries in the global north to continue to um, oppress um, and to extract from um, usually poorer countries in the global south. Um, and obviously it's not as just kind of black and white as that, but it's really useful for us to think about the fact that all of these issues are foundational to the arms trade. And I know the arms trade can feel like this really complicated thing that you can't get your head around, uh, this thing that is distant and happens to other people in other countries, but actually Britain is mired in it. Um, and it's very much time that we understand that it actually there are elements of it present in our everyday lives. So just um, pull out, pulling out a quote, a kind of social card from our People Not War zine, a reminder that the war in Yemen has caused as many tragedies to the Yemeni people as this virus has to the world. So just kind of a stark comparison, really. Thinking about how the coronavirus outbreak and the pandemic has affected your life, um, it's disrupted your schooling, it's disrupted your education, it's disrupted your social life, it's disrupted your family life, it's disrupted every element of our society globally, socially, um, it has impacted our everyday lives. And if we really think about the fact that for lots of people everywhere, things like war are also ways of disrupting their everyday lives and causing um, disaster, causing damage um, in an ongoing manner. And thinking about the fact that many countries in the world, if they have been affected by war and conflict, they also now have the coronavirus outbreak to deal with on top. And in a country like Yemen, which has been bombed um, by a Saudi coalition with US weapons, sorry, with, with um, weapons from the UK, rather, um, they're also having to deal with the consequences of a pandemic, a pandemic that is putting a strain on our um, hospitals and our healthcare systems everywhere and in Yemen particularly um, hospitals and healthcare systems are being targeted by by the bombings so just to really put in, into perspective think about how um, you feel right now in this coronavirus landscape and maybe think about what that feels like if you are also experiencing destruction of war so just to um, to summarise, wherever there is war and conflict, there will always be arms dealers trying to take advantage of it. And this is something we've actually seen during this outbreak as well. Arms companies produce weapons which are sold around the world. And none of this could happen without the complicity and support of governments that do everything they can to maximise sales. The UK government is one of the biggest arms dealers in the world. Every year it approves arms sales to human rights abusing regimes around the world. Some of its arms go to armies while others go to repressive police forces. And there is no such thing as arms control in a conflict zone. Once weapons have been sold, there is no way of knowing what abuses they will be used in. So right now, as I said, UK made weapons are doing huge damage around the world. Nowhere is clearer than in Yemen where Saudi forces are flying UK made fighter jets and dropping UK made bombs and firing UK made missiles. And that's just an image from an artist called Ahmed Jahaf. He again is a friend of Kat. Um, he's a Yemeni artist based in Yemen and he makes a lot of art kind of to express what is going on right now in his country. So again, we're back to Loki and um, the soundtrack to the struggle. So I have pulled out a section of the, um, of the song and I just thought we'd quickly look at the lyrics because again, like I said, I find them really powerful. My music is my natural resource, now I want it back. Till I see, till I sever every single chain, I will not relax. Just constant attack till my world looks like Montserrat. Contact my comrades for combat, what's conscious rap? When you say the truth, they attack like a saber tooth. Thinking clear, they make you disappear like you hate the fruit. We don't need more Bowens, we don't need more Rebors, Weed or Liar Cohens. They tell us about terrorism and tell us about terrorists. Look up, at, look up the definition and tell us what terror is. Only know the definition if the television tells us it. Public enemy number one, they treat me like Professor Griff. This album has been in the making a quarter century, born to bless the beat and rap over recorded melody. I knew the truth since I was a small little boy. I am a product of the system I was born to destroy. So I didn't rap that because I'm not a rapper, um, but I, wanted particularly to pull out a couple of things here. 
So this idea of um, firstly thinking about our ideas of terror, again, I, I found that really powerful because actually if we think about um, what is done with these weapons, UK made weapons and what Britain um, and the USA and other countries like it, but if we just focus on Britain for a moment, has done to the world, those are acts of terrorism. But often when we think of terror, we think of a certain type of person and a certain group of people because of, again, a lot of what the media has told us and the kind of ideas of security and stereotypes. We don't think of um, men in suits as terrorists, but I think I would argue that they're some of the biggest terrorists, often those who sell these weapons um, of, of mass destruction and harm. Um, so yeah, I just thought, again, this, this song, no wonder it's called the soundtrack to the struggle. I thought some of these lyrics were really, really powerful. Um, this idea of when you start to call out the truth, you get attacked often by the public actually, because again, the arms trade and other issues like it are often things that are sometimes shrouded in mystery, but also just made out to be particularly complex that the everyday person can't understand it and not really um, grasp the gravity of the issue. And we're also in this country taught to kind of think about, to see our history of war with pride, to look at World War I and World War II fondly, um, to think about how our grandparents fought in the wars and stuff like that without maybe also thinking critically about what war means. So just wanted to share, um, have a, a quick musical interlude to think about these lyrics from Loki. So here's another pullout from the People Not War Zine. The links between the so-called security industry and domestic oppression have always been strong. So we're, look, we're moving into thinking about policing here. Now, as well as being in this pandemic moment, we are also in what is arguably the second wave of Black Lives Matter, BLM. The murder of George Floyd in May 2020 was the catalyst for protests that sent shockwaves across the globe. You had to be hiding under a rock if you did not feel the ramifications of the murder of George Floyd. In response to the righteous anger of protesters, Trump deemed it appropriate to send in the National Guard and militarized police to quell political dissent. Scenes of tear gas and rubber bullets being used against protesters and journalists horrified the public and British government, um, and the British government has been urged to suspend the sales of British tear gas amid fears they are the same supplies being used to inflict violence on civil rights protesters. Government records show it has granted export licenses worth millions of pounds for the sale of anti-crowd gas, riot equipment, and so-called rubber bullets and other small arms to the US. But the government's own rules say such exports should not go ahead where they are likely to be used for internal repression. And this phrase internal repression is very important. Um, often when we think about repression, we think about, again, countries like Saudi, for example, we think about countries in other parts of the world. We don't think about the US and we don't think about the, a country like the US and how it treats its minority um, groups, particularly its um, African American population, its Hispanic population, um, its indigenous populations because again you know uh, it is stolen ground but we do not think of how that is a country that uses internal repression against its citizens particularly those who are minoritized and we've seen these images of journalists having bullets rubber bullets um, popped into their eyes basically and having you know going blind from it we've seen um, tear gas being used and images of people having to throw milk on their faces we've seen peaceful protests being and um, protesters being arrested we've seen horses being unleashed into crowds of, of primarily black protesters protesting their civil rights and in this second wave of black lives matter protests it is crystal clear that state violence is the same whether it is carried out by the military or the police the line between the two has always been blurred both mired in colonialism and via equipment tactics and the principles that dictate policing, the blur continues. So policing as a means to control the people in war is a way to police the world's people and the world's resources. And I think that kind of says it all really. Um, it's really important to note how over the years, the police um, have become far more militarized. 
um, and are often used in, in a way that maybe they haven't been used in the past, basically. And we can see that now in this BLM moment. And it's also important to note that, again, policing is a racialized practice. The history of policing is a violent history, um, a history often um, mired in colonialism. Um, and in the USA and in the UK, uh, black people are particularly affected um, negatively by policing in this country. Um, there, since 1990, there have been over 1,700 deaths in custody or following police contact in England and Wales, and no police officer has been charged for the deaths of these people. A disproportionate amount of those deaths um, are of black and brown people who um, experience disproportionate force used on them when being arrested. So it's important to note that your experience of policing, maybe as a white middle class person, will be different um, as someone who is maybe black or brown from the inner cities. So again, here we are with a musical interlude from Loki. So really make sure that after this presentation, you go on YouTube and you play the song itself. So yeah, I won't read all of it, but just to point out a few things here on the news, they glorified their own henchmen, support the troops, but won't mention Joe Glenton. Um, it's funny because the rappers are posing as the gangsters while the government taking money as bonuses for bankers. Um, so again, this idea of glorifying, um, glorifying our own henchmen, again, the media's complicity when it comes to um, the ills of government and when it comes to things like the arms trade um, and turning a blind eye basically on what's going on in this country whilst pointing fingers at other countries and other regimes. And again, this question of you are a product of the system you were born to destroy. How do these things affect you and your politics? And how do you break the chain so that you can resist and come into consciousness and know that you have to struggle against um, these injustices? So here is another pullout. The flag is the flag of Bahrain. And this is another pullout from our people, not war zine. Over time, I've come to realize that I have no choice but to keep fighting for my family, for my country, and for democracy. And this is a member of BIRD, um, Saeed, I believe, um, a friend of Kat. He wrote a piece for us in our zine. And I just wanted to show you this particular image and to think about, again, what happens when you come into realization that there's a lot of injustice going on in the world and you and understand that you actually do have capacity and um, power to, to fight against it. And I think particularly young people in this moment have really shown themselves to be power, a powerful group of people, a powerful group who can resist um, and who are able to organize themselves to get to the streets, take to the streets and stand up for themselves and others. So this is just an extract from something that, um, again, friend of Kat, um, Nadine El Anani wrote. Um, she's at Birkbeck University um, and she does a lot of work on empire and she has a book called um, bordering, ordering Britain. So Britain would not be the wealthy, plentiful place that it is without its colonial history. In 1833, Britain abolished slavery only to raise the equivalent of 17 billion in compensation to be paid to slave owners for the loss of their property. This property being human beings. The compensation scheme was the largest state-sponsored payout in British history until it was superseded by the bank bailouts of 2008. Immigration law is not the seemingly harsh but fair mode through which deserving are separated from the undeserving. Instead, it is a crucial mechanism for ensuring that colonial wealth remains out of the hands of those from whom it was stolen. So I already talked a little bit about colonialism, very big subject that we can't dive into right now. Um, but there is, it's important to note that in your curriculum, um, the things you're being taught at school, they often omit and whitewash Britain's role um, in colonial systems, basically a leading role in exporting racism and white supremacy across the world, including exporting it to a country like the USA. So it's really important to note that a lot of the benefits that we experience in this country, the foundations are in fact the backs, uh, the blood, the sweat, the tears of black people and brown people um, in the and the global majority. And so it's just really important for, for, for people to know and understand why um, Britain looks the way it does today. It's because of our colonial history, a colonial history that again, a lot of people are still not familiar with, or when they are familiar with it, they tend to um, skew it and corrupt its real, it's basically the real deal when it comes to this history. So again, another musical interlude with our friend Loki. 
Um, again, some, some definitely go and look up Adam Smith, um, go and look up Rothschild and thinking about um, British philosophies, British banking. Again, all of these things are mired in colonialism. And speaking of corporations, we know that wars have been created to serve the interests of corporations. The largest arms deals have delivered oil, whilst the world's largest militaries are the biggest users of petrol. And of course, in the aftermath of wars and conflict, we see people fleeing conditions they did not create, only to be met with violent borders and a hostile environment. We've heard that phrase a lot. Um, we've heard lots of negative things about migrants um, who are fleeing countries often destroyed by, the, by countries like Britain, for example, and the US. A greener economy in Britain will achieve very little if the government continues to hinder vulnerable countries from doing the same through crippling debt, unfair trade deals, and export of its own deathly extractive industries. The fight for climate justice is the fight of our lives and we need to do it right. Again, an extract for some words from our friends at Wretched of the Earth. Um, and this is just making that link between climate injustice and the arms trade. Um, again, it's not tangential. It's very important that we understand that thinking about the impact of war, um, the climate often, as well as human beings, there is a cost that is paid by, by our Earth as well, basically. Um, and also um, some of the driving forces, if not primary driving forces of um, war include oil. Let's think about a lot of the places that we've seen wars, right? Gulf countries, uh, Iraq, all these kinds of places. There is oil never too far away. Um, it's not a conspiracy, it's just true. So because we know that war is closely linked to profit and capitalism, that may come as no surprise. Again, another piece of art, this time from Ralph Steadman. Um, the only arms we need are these arms. So something very topical about the COVID crisis. So the COVID-19 crisis showed how quickly change can happen when the political will is there. With aerospace countries building ventilators instead of fighter jet engines within weeks backed by government funding, the crisis also laid bare the UK government's historic priorities when it comes to security. It chose to invest in aircraft carriers and nuclear weapons over protective equipment in preparation for a global pandemic. Another security threat the UK government isn't taking seriously enough is the climate crisis, as we've said before. And as the fifth largest global contributor to historic carbon emissions and the ninth largest economy in the world, the UK must take a lead in transitioning to a low carbon economy and support poorer countries already coping with the impacts of climate change. The UK must play its part in ensuring the rights of those in countries where the minerals used in, rene in renewables are mined, causing conflict and human rights abuses. This has had a huge impact on people of color in countries still coping with the legacies of colonialism. So really, this is just drawing together a lot of what we've already said, and also highlighting the fact that the COVID-19 outbreak, this pandemic, this virus has shown us that actually, when the will is there um, and the urgency is recognized, we can transform a lot of things, right? From giving homeless people somewhere to actually live, even though those measures have since been undone, but also, um, turning, basically moving people from these kinds of industries and giving them jobs in, in industries that are useful, um, building ventilators, you know, re redirecting people's skills, all these things can be done and be done quite quickly. Um, as a kind of side note, every two years, um, Campaign Against Arms Trade, um, as part of the Stop the Arms Fair Coalition, goes to the Excel Centre in London, many of you will know it if you're based in London, and we campaign um, against and protest against uh, one of the largest arms fairs in the world, the DSEI Arms Fair, and that takes place at Excel. And what's very interesting is during this COVID-19 outbreak, the Excel Centre transformed itself into the Nightingale Hospital. Um, and again, we applaud that, although there's lots of controversy around how useful that was, the very fact that the NHS has been stripped of its funding to the point where there weren't even enough nurses to actually run that hospital. That said, though, we much prefer a space like that being used for those purposes rather than being used as a shopping mall for death every two years. But it's just interesting to note that things were able to be changed very, very quickly because of the COVID-19 outbreak. So I'm coming towards the end of my talk. Just a reminder of where you can find Soundtracks of the Struggle, head to YouTube and enjoy yourself over there. And like I said, um, 
I chose that song. It's one of my favourite ones. And also Loki is a friend of Campaign Against Arms Trade. But also I think the lyrics are very, very important to reflect on. And I wanted to share um, an extract of a poem by a Yemeni poet um, called Amina Atik. Um, this poem is, again, basically about home. Um, and I will not do it the justice that she does when she performs it live. She's from Liverpool, a Yemeni Liverpudlian. Um, and whenever she performs this, it's always so, so beautiful. Uh, but I will give it my best shot. And you can also find this at the back of the publication, People Not War. I always felt like a stranger returning home, but I only visit in the summer. But you were always too kind, waiting for my return. Five years ago this summer, I kissed your forehead and whispered, I will see you soon. This goodbye drowned and summer memories faded. Yet I am a stranger to your pain, the blockade to your life-saving needs, the grief in your own home, your open wound, no doctor has seen a skin disease like this one before, your heartbreak bigger than love, your headache in the morning no coffee can cure, the fear polluting your air with no one to trust. The numbness to your throat left you speechless and the stack of debt sitting on your shoulders. The illness of your parents unspoken of, your missing husband and the death of your child. So again, this beautiful poem is by Yemeni Liverpudlian poet Amina Atik. And it's very much about a trip that she made, a, a visit to um, Yemen or the longing to visit her home country. And it's important, I wanted to add some poetry in here because I think Poetry is often a really powerful way to express um, very complex ideas, very challenging emotions. Um, and no doubt some of you watching, listening, will be poets in your own right or writers in your own right or use it as a form of escape. And when we think about a war, when we think about policing, when we think about all these issues, borders, migration, climate justice, at the end or at the heart of all these issues are real people. At the heart of war and its impact are real human beings, children, young people, women, men, um, all sorts of people, the old, the young, and all of these human stories should be at the center of it. When we think about these things, we should not think about them in abstract. We shouldn't think about them as something happening in the distance. They're happening now and they're happening to fellow human beings and they're happening in our world and we do have agency to be able to um, struggle against these things and to show meaningful solidarity when we see and hear about injustice across the world. And that's another image from an artist. Um, this again is also a piece that features in People Not War Zine alongside Amina's poem. And this artist, um, I apologize, I forget her name, but she is an artist from one of our projects called Art the Arms Fair. Um, and what I will do is make sure that the name of this artist is shared somewhere in the notes to this um, webinar. And if you want to stay in touch, um, the best thing to do is to find us on Twitter. And we've now just joined Instagram. So at Cat UK, you can also find out more on cat.org.uk. You can also read People Not War Zine directly um, from our homepage. And if you want to be in touch with me, you can email me at sienna at cat.org.uk to find out more. But yeah, it's been a pleasure. And I hope that this has been an interesting, thought-provoking introduction to some very complex issues. And I do encourage you to go find out more, read more about these issues, um, go on our website, go on our YouTube. We've got a series of talks there called Arms Trade 101 and Intersecting Issues. Um, and these talks go in depth on each subject um, by a variety of, of speakers from our reading group series that we have recently just completed. So thanks very much Woodcroft for, for having me. And I, again, I hope that this will be a useful resource to um, act as an introduction to intersecting issues with the arms trade. Thank you so much, Sienna. That was so great.